Hello everybody, it's a pleasure to bring Printon Knowledge Series from the House of Printon Pharmaceuticals. In this series, we will partner with renowned medical experts across the country in the field of dermatology, gynecology, pediatrics and various other therapies who will bring their vast knowledge and rich medical experience. We hope the content of Brinton Knowledge Series would add value and contribute to your clinical experience. Thank you. Good evening all esteemed members of the medical fraternity. <clears throat> uh, wish you all a lovely Sunday evening today. Uh, as the world observes International Alopecia Day on the 1st of August, it is indeed an honor and privilege to have with us today evening our esteemed speakers for today's International Symposium on this occasion to commemorate International Alopecia Day. We all have had nightmares about losing our hair. And imagine seeing your own precious strands of hair falling in clumps right before your eyes. And that's what alopecia does to you. Now, put the, to put the condition in perspective, alopecia, as you all know, is a form of hair loss that kicks in when your own immune system mistakenly views hair follicles as a threat to your health. This causes the hair to come out often in clumps. The amount of hair loss is different for everyone. And in some cases, it affects the eyebrows, eyelashes, and face, as well as other parts of the body. Understanding what is alopecia, what causes it, and how to tackle hair fall today is the overall intent of this medical symposium today. Uh, incidentally, doctors, this is the 14th webinar Brinton Pharmaceuticals has organized so far in this pandemic period. And the response from the entire medical fraternity has been pretty overwhelming to connect via digital platform and exchange their scientific insights in making each session a huge success. This webinar is the second international webinar we are hosting. And it has the distinction of again having teachers and academicians of our country and our two neighboring countries, Nepal and Bangladesh. A warm good evening to all the respected members of the medical fraternity of all the three countries and also the audience of doctors who have connected not only from India, but also from abroad. I'm Srikumar Nair, Chief Marketing Officer for Brinton Pharmaceuticals. At the outset, I and my team would like to pay my huge respects and regards to each one of you, the COVID warriors, who have been in the forefront of fighting the COVID pandemic by protecting and saving patients while we were all safe indoors in the comfort of our homes. As the country goes now for a planned unlock we all are very hopeful that we will be able to successfully face the challenges and bring normalcy to our lives. Therefore, once again, please accept our sincere respects and huge appreciations to all the doctors who have taken time out on a Sunday evening to share your valuable insights on a very important hair disorder, which is alopecia. I need to talk to you about the topic today, which is patterned hair loss, the latest trends. And today, incidentally, we have a galaxy of distinguished stalwarts in the area of dermatology both Indian and international cables amongst us. It is my proud privilege to therefore extend a very warm welcome to this evening session to the chief moderator of today's session, respected Dr. Anil Abraham from Bangalore. Thank you. Dr. Anil Abraham certainly does not require any introduction, but certainly it is my pleasure today to say a very few important words about him. I have known him personally for more than one and a half decades now. Uh, Dr. Anil is a multifaceted and multi-talented human being, I must say. For many of us, he's a doctor and a very fine dermatologist. He has been one of the most outstanding students. And apart from that, he's a fine teacher to many dermatology students. During the day, he sits in his clinic examining anxious dermatology patients who walk in with their dermatological problems. And by evening, he transforms himself and he takes the stage to entertain his loyal audiences either through a play or an improvised comedy show. Dr. Anil Abraham comfortably switches between his profession and passion. He's a powerful orator, singer, a writer, and also an actor. He has recently acted in a super hit Malayalam movie, Uire. A warm welcome, Dr. Anil, to moderate this session. We are hoping to see a fantastic session and interaction between all of us today. Thank we are you. also indeed honored to have with us today, Dr. Rachita Durat who heads the dermatology department in Sion Hospital, Mumbai, and comes with a rich three decades of rich experience as faculty in dermatology. If one is talking about trichology or any other hair disorders, 
it cannot be complete without Dr. Rachita's contribution to this medical topic. A very warm welcome to you, ma'am, as our esteemed panelists from India for today's webinar. Dr. Zenath Miraj is our second panelist for today's webinar from Bangladesh. Dr. Zenath is ex-professor of dermatology from the Chittagong Medical College, Bangladesh, and has held many senior academic positions in the South Asian region. Her academic inputs in today's webinar will be extremely useful for all the listeners. A very warm welcome to you, Dr. Zenath, representing Bangladesh for this webinar. Dr. Rupak Ghimire is our third panelist for today's webinar from Nepal. Dr. Rupak is Assistant Professor Kathmandu Medical College, and we are indeed thankful to him for accepting our invitation today for being a part of our webinar. He is a pioneer in hair transplant surgery in Nepal and has completed more than 1,000 hair transplantation cases in more than five years. A very, very warm welcome to you, Dr. Rupak, representing Nepal. For today's evening webinar, we also have two very young and leading dermatologists from India who are the speakers for today's webinar. The first speaker is Dr. Prashant Palwade from Aurangabad, who's one of the main areas of interest is trichology. We all would be immensely benefited by his inputs today. A very warm welcome to you, Dr. Prashant for this webinar today. Thank you. Dr. Dharamveer Singh, as we all know, is from New Delhi, and he has played a very significant role in the area of trichology and hair transplantation all throughout these years. It will certainly be a pleasure to listen to him also. A very warm welcome to you, sir, Dr. Dharamveer. Thank you, Mr. Uh, with these few words, I hand over the session to Dr. Ashwin to take it ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, actually, I was supposed to give the introduction, but you have very beautifully introduced all the panelists for today's webinar. Thank you so much. Now I request Dr. Anil to please take over the session. Okay. So since we have uh, our uh, main speakers here today, Without much ado, it's a very important topic and it's uh, International Alopecia Day. So I hand over the mic uh, to Dr. Prashant, who uh, both the speakers will have about 10 plus uh, one or two minutes to uh, deal with their topics. And Dr. Prashant will introduce us to the topic of the medical management of patterned hair loss, following which we'll have a talk on surgical management. Dr. Prashant, over to you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I'm sharing my presentation. Is it visible? Yes, it is. Go ahead, Dr. Prashant. It's visible. Some medical management of patterned hair loss. Scope of this presentation is review of therapeutic options, its efficacy and side effects, and what are new perspectives for AGA management. Androgenetic alopecia, as we all know, is a non-scarring progressive miniaturization of the hair follicle with a pattern distribution in predisposed men and women. Treatment goal is to stop progression and prevent further thinning. And next uh, goal is to regrow hair. Now, one important thing is we're getting a lot of uh, androgenetic alopecia in adolescents, earlier age group. So a little bit about that. 15% of adolescents have early onset AG according to one study, and it can appear as early as seven years of age. Uh, these are usually mild types. There is a strong family history. Pubertal signs are usually present. In the absence of pubertal signs or in severe grades of androgenetic alopecia in adolescents, hormonal assessment needs to be done, like total testosterone, DHEAS, prolactin, and thyrotropin. Finasteride cannot be used in such cases as there is no data below 18 years of age uh, in adolescents. Minoxidil uh, fairly does well, 2 to 5% twice a day uh, is an effective therapy for AGA in adolescents. Now, coming back to uh, AGA in men and women, it affects them in the prime of their youth, uh, where they're looking for partner, job, and a successful career. Uh, they would not like to search for where they fit in uh, this classification, Norwood Hamilton or Ludwig's. So what do we, as a clinician, have to offer to them? Category 1 drugs, I would mention, would be uh, anti-androgen therapies, 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, uh, finasteride, dutasteride, and topical finasteride. Finasteride, as we know, is USFD approved. It shows better outcome in younger patients, mid-scalp and vertex areas uh, of baldness. You need to give lifelong treatment. It reduces DHT levels by 70%. If patient stops it, hair status returns to pre-treatment state in a year's time. 
these are the side effects which we know of one should be aware of permanent sexual adverse effects and depression although it is uh, mentioned in some uncontrolled studies but one should be aware of post finasteride syndrome semen concentration of finasteride is low uh, so uh, uh, um, a male taking uh, finasteride has no risk to pregnant women or to the fetus those taking fertility treatments and if there is there are semen alterations finas finasteride should be avoided baseline prostate specific antigen in all patients above 50 years is recommended finasteride in female androgenetic alopecia is an off label use higher dose should be used 5 mg per day birth control measures if you are using it in premenopausal women it should not be used in women with family history of breast malignancy as finasteride causes hyper estrogen state dutasteride is not fda approved for androgenetic alopecia as we know it blocks both the isoenzymes it reduces dht levels by 90% it's approved in korea and mexico uh, dutasteride 0.5 mg is superior to finasteride 1 mg per day so that's an advantage in finasteride resistant cases are showing good results with dutasteride so these are the studies initial side effect profile of dutasteride was same as with finasteride but but as you continue using dutasteride the sexual side effects were similar to placebo so that's a favorable side effect profile as far as dutasteride is concerned according to these studies topical finasteride has been uh, tried in a small randomized control trial 1% finasteride was equally effective to oral finasteride in this particular study and topical finasteride is shown to reduce scalp dht levels significantly against the systemic uh, serum levels new topical anti androgen called clascoterone is in phase 2 trial this would be first topical anti androgen if it gets approval it has been uh, published in journals of drugs and uh, dermatology 2019 paper same molecule has been uh, in use as a anti acne therapy because of its anti androgenic properties category 2 drugs are androgen receptor agonist mostly used in female androgen dependent hair loss uh, spironolactone ceprotron acetate and flutamide spironolactone decreases testosterone levels uh, used in doses of 50 to 200 mg per day it has a long uh, good long term safety profile hyperkalemia monitoring is not required in one of the studies 40 44% state most of the studies are with high doses of sand with the orin and feminization of male peters are known side effects shutamide hepatotox minoxidil prostaglandin analogs and ketoconazole minoxidil is usfd approved uh, there is an enzyme called sulfo transferase which plays important role in deciding whether a patient will respond to minoxidil or no only 40 to 50% patients respond to minoxidil so that's a non responders are very high so it's very good if we get to know this so this is done with minoxidil response test energy hair, hair roots from border of uh, ball patch near vertex are plucked immersed in solution for 24 hours quantitative assay of sulfo transferase that is sulf 1a1 is done if it is low patient will not respond to minoxidil in one of the studies the sensitivity was 95% and specificity was 76% Folia is a company which has submitted an application at US FDA for approval for minoxidil response test. Minoxidil can cause allergic contact dermatitis. In that case, you can use a foam formulation. Hypertrichosis is more with five percent more in females. Uh, it results in three months after drug discontinuation. Formulation should be left on scalp at least for four hours. It is not advised during pregnancy, but can be used during lactation. oral minoxidil has been in use since last few years in endogenetic alopecia as well as stilogen effluem and chronic telogen effluem 41 men with endogenetic alopecia uh, showed 90% improvement clinical improvement dose was 2.5 to 5 mg per day uh, adverse effects were pt bel edema hypertrichosis and increased shedding in initial phase 
This patient, uh, uh, female endogenetic alopecia, was given one milligram of minoxidil as a monotherapy, and you can see good amount of improvement in six months' time. This is another study by Dr. Rodney Sinclair, wherein he has used oral minoxidil, very low dose, 0.25 milligram per day, uh, which he compounded with spironolactone, 25 milligram as a single capsule. Fluid retention caused by minoxidil was countered by spironolactone. That's the logic behind combining these two. Plus, spironolactone has anti-androgenic properties. Those with low blood pressure were given 50 gram of salt, which was added to the capsule. Another article by Dr. Rodney Sinclair, wherein he compared minoxidil 1 milligram versus minoxidil 5% topical solution. And he found both were comparable. So those patients were not tolerating 5% uh, minoxidil solution or uh, the compliance is a problem. One milligram oral minoxidil tablet can be a good solution. Minoxidil tablet in India is available as five milligram tablet, cost uh, around 15 to 30 rupees per tablet. And these are the brand names. Prostaglandins, latanoprost and bimetoprost are known to have uh, effect on anagen phase of hair. Latanoprost has been studied, which has shown significant increase in hair density in 16 men with AGA. Bimetoprost in one of the studies, there was no improvement. Uh, in one of the patients, erosive pustular dermatitis occurred of scalp following topical latanoprost for endogenetic alopecia. Another oral prostaglandin called cetipiprant, a selective oral antagonist to PGD2 receptor, will possibly be developed for AGA. It is in phase 2 trial. Ketoconazole reduces uh, malaysia induced inflammation. It has anti-androgenic properties, but, but larger randomized control trials are uh, required to confirm this. Coadjuvant therapies are laser therapy, hair transplantation, and camouflage. Laser therapy, low-level light therapy using 655 nanometer diodes has been used. US FDA approved has been there for this particular device, laser comb, in 2011. It was used three times a week for 15 minutes every session, and it has shown significant improvement, and it was used for four to six months. There are different devices available in India as well, but uh, none of these are standardized and approved. High energy lasers has been used, fractional RBM glass, 1550 nanometer, but more studies are required to get best parameters and treatment intervals. Camouflage, hair fibers, masking solutions, micropigmentation, hair extension, and wigs have been tried. Coming to emerging therapies, PRP, scalp microneedling, vent signaling, stem cells, and jack stat signaling. PRP induces growth factors in cytokines, which promotes hair stem cells. There are multiple studies. So PRP has a theoretical scientific basis. Preliminary evidence suggests it, is, it has a beneficial role, but standardization of procedure and further studies are important to confirm its role. Scalp microneedling releases platelet-derived growth factors. It activates follicle stem cells, and it helps in overexpression of hair growth-related genes. Uh, it has been studied extensively uh, by one of our panelists, Dr. Rachita Durat. I think she will enlighten more on this particular aspect, but it has been a useful therapy. Wind signaling, these are the pathways which stimulate and regulate follicular neogenesis. Valproic acid, hair stimulating complex is in phase two study. Uh, SM04554 is in phase one study. So these are promising pathways which might give us good drugs in future. Stem cells, Replicel is a company which has developed a culture expanded follicular cells obtained through a patient's skin biopsy. It is in phase two trial. These uh, cells are injected into the bald areas. So uh, from dermal papilla cells beneath it, dermal sheath cells are there, they are cultured. And these uh, cultured dermal sheath cells are injected intradermally. From there, they migrate to the dormant hair follicles and they help in activation of the follicle. Also, there are chances that it might lead to new hair growth formation as well. This particular paper published in March 2020 in JAD is related to this particular method. The results suggest that cell therapy with autologous dermal sheath cells may be useful as a new therapeutic method for treating male and female pattern hair loss. jack stat pathway. We all know JAK inhibitors have been used in alopecia areata and they were found to promote anagen phase. So they are being used in endogenetic alopecia as well. Melatonin has been used long back uh, as an antioxidant as well as anti-androgen. 
but there were no uh, drastic changes and so it has not been a really um, uh, proven and good therapy for treatment of androgenetic alopecia other therapies like plant extracts peptides which are out there in the market promoted uh, heavily but there is lot of uh, paucity of studies so they were not uh, included as, pa as part of this presentation in years to come we might witness specific and targeted therapies for androgenetic alopecia thank you for patient listening thank you dr prashant that uh, was quite a comprehensive coverage on the update on management uh we will proceed with our second talk dr dharmeer will will tell us about uh, surgical intervention and then we'll open it up to the uh, entire panel so that we can discuss what's uh, what's new in the management of trichology both medical and surgical uh welcome dr zinat you've joined us uh, now thank and i'm so, so happy much. to have you thank you so much dr anil thank you so much okay dr dharmeer uh, you can proceed with your uh, surgical management and you have the uh, screen share with you So you can share your slides. Thank you so much. Having a good having you. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Slides. Am I audible? Yes, yes, very much. Please so, go ahead. Uh, I'll be presenting the surgical management of pattern hair loss, and I'm Dr. Dharmveer Singh, uh, consultant dermatologist at Iran Hair and Skin Clinic in Delhi. So I'll be presenting an update on how to manage uh, the hair loss surgically. So surgically, it is uh, mostly managed by the hair restoration surgery, and hair restoration surgery for androgenetic alopecia it involves various forms of hair transplantation. Initially, uh, surgical uh, scalp reduction surgeries uh, were done, but uh, nowadays they are not done uh, frequently. And the basis of hair restoration surgery uh, was donor dominance, in which the androgen insensitive hair follicles, uh, which keep their properties even when transplanted into the scalp areas affected by the androgenetic alopecia, and there was redistribution of unaffected follicles. the hair restoration surgery is useful in both males and females so just a brief about the evolution of hair restoration how it began so it started uh, the roots of the modern day surgical hair uh, restoration was cultivated in japan in late 1930s so the dermatologist dr okuda he described in detail his ground breaking work in surgical hair restoration for burn victims where he used a punch technique to uh, transplant Yes. So he used two to four millimeters uh, of punches from the donor area and transplanted in the scarred areas. In 1943, another uh, Japanese dermatologist, Dr. Tamura, he refined Dr. Okuda's technique and uh, used smaller grafts consisting of one to three hairs, and he replaced uh, lost pubic hair in his uh, female patients. The technique was very much similar to the techniques which are being used today. and in 1952 dr norman orientage which everybody must be aware of so as, as a so he uh, performed his first uh, known uh, hair transplant in the us on a man suffering from male pattern baldness so it was that day that dr orientage essentially reinvented the modern day hair transplantation and after 7 years he published his uh, findings and he gave the theory of donor dominance so uh, the work which was done initially the punch grafts uh, 2 to 4 mm punch were which used to be taken initially so this is how the uh, used to look uh, with very big scars used to be there in the donor area so this was cosmetically unacceptable to the patient so it needs refinement and uh, this is in, in the front so the plugs which created a doll's head like appearance so this was there for next uh, 20 years as the hair restoration surgery continued and but in uh, 1980s the strip excisions began to replace the plug technique so dr carlos ubel in brazil popularized the uh, large number of small grafts also dr william rasman in united states he began using thousands of micrographs in a single session in 1990s there was turning point where uh, there was advent of follicular unit uh, micrografting 
and uh, follicular unit extraction, which has made the hair transplantation a virtually undetectable and a viable option for many hair loss sufferers. So hair transplant consists of uh, two methods. One is uh, follicular unit transplantation, also known as strip method, and follicular unit excision, also known as follicular unit extraction, and body hair transplant also. Body hair transplant will not be discussed in this. So various steps are uh, there before we undertake a patient for hair transplantation, and patient has to go, uh, careful planning has to be undertaken before we take uh, anybody for uh, transplantation and patient is prepared, uh, proper anesthesia is given and then it's followed by the graft harvesting and securing the harvested grafts, and transplantation and then dressing. So each step is individualized in the practice and the planning of the patient, it consists of deciding the number of grafts, hairline density and uh, lump, some blood test or thorough medical situation mm -hmm and uh, marking of the hairline and after the shortening of the hair if needed and preparation with antiseptic solution the anesthesia is carried out so mostly local anesthesia is preferred however regional or local anesthesia with sedation can be chosen so when an entire anesthesia is established a tumorescent solution is injected uh, both to the donor and to the recipient area it helps in the expansion of the skin so that the follicles are uh, uh, easy to harvest from the donor area and the survival of the harvested graft is dependable on the temperature, hydration and the infection and trauma we cause. So what we need to do, uh, avoid is the transaction of the grafts and, and there should not be any crushing or dehydration of the follicles during the process. Uh, if we do, uh, if we follow the technique meticulously, then that will ensure the best outcome. And the grafts are stored in a cold solution uh, preserved at 4 to 8 degrees Celsius uh, just to prevent the ischemic and reperfusion injury. Uh, just uh, names of some uh, holding solutions like uh, normal saline or ringer lactate or uh, cell culture media and, uh, like Dulbeck or modified eagle medium, they can be used as uh, storage media. Some people use PRP also for graph storage and the temperature range is 4 degrees to 10 degrees C. So the Common steps uh, in both FUT and FUE is the step one is consisting of harvesting, step two is uh, recipient site creation, and step three is implantation. But the techniques differ. So in the step one, uh, the harvesting of follicles is, uh, is by a strip method in FUT and it could be isolated follicular unit extraction in FUE. Just a pictorial representation of how the things work First, the local anesthesia is given and followed by harvesting from the donor area. And then there is an implantation of the grafts and that leads to a result after a period of six to nine months. And so this is the second uh, st step, which is called as uh, recipient site creation. So the nest or the recipient sites or slits for the grafts can be created by a sharp punch or needles or scalpels in selected sizes. So it depends upon what kind of grafts we are having, whether they are single grafts, uh, double grafts, or triple graft. Uh, and accordingly, we have to use the size of the uh, needles or the uh, size of the blade to create the slits. And uh, we have to create a hairline in such a manner that it uh, produces more natural looking results. Uh, the next last step is the implantation. And the number of hair units uh, required for the recipient size can be calculated by formulas defined by both frontal and vertex region. And the normal hair density is around 100 units per centimeter square. But in general, in the recipient area, we can achieve up to 30 to 40 units per centimeter square. It's a pretty good density though. Uh, but some people have attemp attempted to up to 60 units per centimeter square as well. And forceps or implanters are used for uh, implantation generally. So in the strip technique, uh, the donor area is shaved and an elliptical excision is made for hair follicle harvesting. The dimensions of ellipse are calculated uh, according to the recipient area that is to be grafted. And this the door, after the excision, the donor area is closed meticulously and to reduce the scar formation. 
these days uh, trichophytic uh, closure is being used most of the plastic surgeons and the other dermatologists they are using the trichophytic uh, closure to give a more cosmetically acceptable appearance of the scar the collected hair bearing skin is then further dissected under magnification and the extra tissue hair root as well as the epithelium around are removed and the process is called as slivering and the grafts containing clusters of one two or three follicles are put into petri dishes containing cool saline or holding medium later on the grafts are inserted appropriately to the recipient area so in fue in contrast to fut the extraction of uh, singular follicle endnits is done by using circular punches initially as i told it was using uh, larger punches of 2 to 4 mm but uh, now it is uh, more refined and more uh, micro and generally 0.8 0.9 mm punches are used these days this the pictorial representation and uh, the punches could be handheld or it could be motorized and these days even uh, robotic uh, systems are also available to do the fue harvesting and though the fue uh, process it needs a uh, longer learning curve and uh, it requires very long operation time and excellent hand eye coordination is needed the doctor has to be patient and uh, physically fit and should have a uh, stamina to work long hours but uh, there is also one uh, thing that if you continue to practice fue for a long time there is a potential that you might develop repetitive motion disorder in time because the motorized punch which you are using uh, is uh, cause lot of vibrations another method which is a, a improvisation on the fue is a direct hair implantation technique which uh, uh, leads to in decrease in the transit time uh, which may reduce the graft survival so the follicles are implanted as soon as they are harvested this technique was found simple and feasible modification of fue though it is expensive the learning curve in this is uh, high and uh, surgery needs more qualified personal per patient and the pens and which are used in this procedure are relatively expensive so it uh, becomes uh, quite expensive as compared to the fut or fue coming on to uh, robotic hair restoration it involves uh, the first in this category is neograph machine which was uh, us fd approved in 2009 for hair restoration so it enables it's a suction based device uh, uh, which uh, suction based device uh, for extraction of follicles and the follicles are collected in a suction canister in which they are transplanted later by using a hand piece of 0.1 and 0.1 1.2 mm punches and are produced specifically for this purpose the motor is silent and vibration free but uh, there is a steep learning curve and the there is uh, high cost makes the machine uh, disadvantageous uh, dr daram we completed yes, your time if you could wrap up please okay the next uh, the last is uh, atas uh, robotic system which was fd approved in 2011 for use in harvesting follicular units and it is supported with the artificial uh, intelligence and the recent one is the uh, 9x uh, robotic system so it reduces the potential for over harvesting it is faster more accurate and it can take out like 1300 grafts per hour and it works by skimming over the surface of the uh, donor area rather than retracting away and it is also fitted with the hair studio uh, that helps in the it's a app based technology which uh, the surgeon can consult with the candidate to stimulate the final outcome it also helps in the creation of the recipient site so i think just uh, the other therapies which are available surgically are artificial hair implantation and uh, stem cell uh, treatments are also available so we can leave some for the discussion part of the sure, 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 a few sure, questions sure. on this yeah. sure okay. sure so we can just um, these are the few results just yeah, wanted to show, show us something
yeah show pictures please so yeah. this is uh, fue transplant which was done in a patient of almost grade 6 uh, baldness he was 32 years old male he was transplanted uh, 4351 grafts over two days so this is one picture this is one picture of patient in the frontal baldness and 2,142 grafts were transplanted in this patient. And this is one patient I wanted to share with the uh, uh, people on board. Uh, this uh, old lady uh, which has been suffering from uh, non-scarring baldness. So she came across to me, so I have never seen a patient like her. I just took a picture just to share it. So this shows a female androgenetic alopecia. And this is also one female patient who's having an extreme gait of uh, baldness. This is a young female having patterned hair loss similar to the male pattern uh, baldness. She was 21 years old. So some of the results with PRP therapy and minoxidil. And this is only the micro needling in this patient we did. And some of the results with again PRP and minoxidil. Thank you. Thank you so much Dr. Dharambe. That was really impressive. So we've had uh, two great presentations already. One from Dr. Prashant Palvade telling us about the uh, update on medical management of patterned alopecia. And Dr. Dharambir uh, Singh has now taken us uh, through the surgical management with some very impressive before and after pictures. So we have the uh, two young dermatologists from India who have uh, taken us through an update of what's new in alopecia management. And we have a, um, we have a very impressive panel with us. Uh, consisting of Dr. Rachita Durat from India, Dr. Zinat Merit from Bangladesh, and Dr. Rupa Pimire from Nepal. Welcome to all of you and welcome to the speakers once again. Welcome to all the delegates who've signed on and I hope all of you are qualified dermatologists and will be helping your patients to treat their hair loss better. So uh, if Ashwin could help me with uh, the screen share and uh, we'll go to the questions. We have got some questions from the audience already. I'll just start with some simple things to warm mm -hmm. up the uh, entire panel. And um, I will, uh, after that, help to deal with the audience questions also before we close this session. The first question that I had was a very general one. And I'd like Dr. Uh, Rachita to take this, please. What is the clinical spectrum of alopecia patients you see? What kind of age, gender, socioeconomic status uh, patients do you see? Because you have a hospital practice predominantly. Dr. Rachita? Uh, uh, both uh, so basically uh, nowadays I am seeing patients with age group between 20 to 30 yes uh, uh, however uh, we are seeing uh, uh, androgenic mm -hmm. alopecia in children also even 7 years, 5 years, 10 years and there is nothing like a socioeconomic status uh, gender if you look at the gender all men are more concerned about their baldness than females so that way, the true prevalence of uh, AGA cannot be ascertained in females. But uh, like um, Dr. Dharambi showed, there can be patients who have quite significant hair loss in females also. Yes, yes. And it is more devastating for them because it's mm -hmm. absolutely not socially acceptable for a lady to be uh, visibly balding. Yeah. So that, See, that is it. By the time they seek a, a treatment from a dermatologist, they have lost so much hair. They lose hair from the mid skull, they lose hair from the occipital area, and probably there is no option left of hair transplant in them. Dr. Zina? They, they try all kinds of therapy at home, they go to alternative medications. Like men are not like that. I don't know how, somehow. Immediately <laughs> <Men, laughs> come to a dermatologist. <laughs> men are easier. Uh, say, Dr. Zina, do you agree? Is that true mm -hmm. in Bangladesh also? Are you seeing a lot of men uh, with uh, hair loss, Dr. Zinar? I'm actually, uh, I don't, uh, I'm with, my view is a little different because what yes. I see is um, uh, um, each day with, in my practice, each day I see, I'm seeing more and more men who are so concerned about their hair loss and mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they are ready to come to the doctors for help. And um, like, uh, previously, Dr. Rachita will know that um, the ladies would come to ladies and the men would shy away from the female dermatologist and not come with their problems of hair and looks. But nowadays, they are favoring us. They feel that we are more empathetic and we understand the 
understand their psyche, you know, their psychological state. So I am getting a lot of male patients with the, uh, with the androgenic alopecia or patent hair loss. And even females also, they are, um, they are having, uh, they are complaining of this. And uh, what is happening is that um, um, since uh, uh, it's the gender, so um, I have uh, like, uh, I won't go into the treatment, but we do approach these two uh, genders differently. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, that, that's interesting. We'll come back to the management part. Uh, Dr. Rupak, is it any different in Nepal? Is it, uh, do you see younger patients? Do you see more men, more women? I think <clears throat> since I'm a hair transplant surgeon, I see more of men. Yes. Okay, and okay. Uh, I see the more, most common age groups I've seen is 20 to 40. I don't see Correct. more of, there are, but, but if I see the common ones, and I will clearly see, of course, the patients with at least upper middle class come to us if you if we talk about socioeconomic status because since i'm a hair transplant surgeon people have that <clears throat> notion that if i go to this doctor my my uh, first first choice would be a hair transplant so i would uh -huh. say a little bit of at least upper middle class kind of people and 20 to 40 age group come to me regularly if i if i ask my practice dr prashant you already mentioned that you're seeing younger patients also is that uh, is that a trend that you're seeing over the last few years Teenagers and yeah, uh, like, young adults? Right. Teen, teenagers. Not in uh, very high numbers, but mm. definitely we are seeing in androgenetic alopecia presenting in college going or school going students. So um, awareness is much more. Yeah. Awareness. Uh, Dr. Darambir, are you getting young patients coming in for transplant? People who are 17, 18, 19 years old asking for transplant? Not Dr. really, Darambir. sir. Actually, I'm getting patients who are uh, beyond 20 years of age. Okay. And but yes, people are aware. The young patients they are aware about uh, their hair uh, issues and they mm -hmm. want to seek uh, help. But I'm not getting any patients who are less than 20 years of age and they want to get a hair transplant. But I not. do get patients who are more than 21, 20 years of age. But and their hair loss is so progressive that uh, they there is no other option left for them but just to, but to go for a hair transplant. Ashwin, can we move to the second question, please? Yeah. What are the clinical tests you almost always do in a patient with uh, hair loss besides the, the, the kind of bedside clinical tests that you would do? Dr. Prashant, would you like to handle that? Any of the yeah. tests that you always do? <clears throat> Apart from uh, clinical tests, which include, you know, uh, hair pull test or dermoscopy. Yes, uh, yes. I want to know about the yeah, bedside I, clinical tests. Uh, so, uh, hair pull test is something uh, which I would like to do in my cases because a lot of times endogenetic alopecia has uh, a telogen effluent part in it or chronic, chronic telogen effluent part in it. So, would like to uh, uh, identify that and treat it accordingly. Then, uh, a lot of times, uh, endogenetic uh, alopecia areata, diffuse type of alopecia areata, presents with you know diffuse hair loss and then there is no specific patches. So in those cases, dermoscope uh, scope helps to differentiate it from endogenetic alopecia. So we'll come to the details of that. Dr. Zina, do your patients also come with little plastic bags filled with hair and then panicking saying, doctor, I feel all my hair is dropping out every time I comb. And then they'll come with little bunches of, uh, you know, collections of hair to you. Does that happen there too? Yes, very much so. Because they really, uh, <clears throat> when they come to you, they feel that maybe the doctors won't, you know, accept their story. So yes. they have those back, uh, back full, full of uh, hair or maybe hair uh, per week distributed in envelopes. So, and, and so some of them sit in front of you and go through the hair and, and will present you with hair. Yeah. Ooh, and then, prove then, the point. Okay. Yeah. Then you have to speak up and say, oh, no, don't, don't, don't uh, mess my clinic. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Rachita, you uh, have written the uh, paper, written one of the good papers on the testing. So what would you, uh, when they ask you for numbers, how much hair can you lose in a day and the hair uh, count that they say, what would you say to your patients? What kind of advice do you give them on or about bedside tests when they're asking about what, how do I know that I'm losing too much hair? Yeah, so my belief is that losing uh, uh, like losing more than 100 is abnormal. That I don't believe it. Anyone who, see, who has lost a co good quantity of hair may not lose that much hair. So I generally counsel them if they are losing daily uh, uh, hair count, which is more than 50 to 70, then you should take it as significant. So I, I ask them to get 
four days hair count and i hmm. tell them at least you count of one day which you feel is maximum because that also will tell me that how much she is losing now if that speed she is losing suppose she is losing more than 100 hair that speed in few weeks she will show baldness so okay. this person requires a special attention special counseling also after the therapy you don't see hair growth immediately in few months yes. so this is the only test will uh, give you that patient is improving with your therapy or not so i ask them to repeat four days hair count a monthly basis so hair so count hair pull test are some of the things simple things yeah, that we can do in addition to track always in all patients and i don't believe the hair positive hair pull test differentiate between androgenic alopecia versus chronic telogen effluem only the trichoscope can tell you Okay. but that positive pull test also is a marker for uh, your response activity. to therapy an activity also of the yeah, disease unique activity, activity. Yeah. so certainly when your patient is on positive pull test i always write down after a few months if the patient has become negative pull mm. test and Good. i also grade positive pull test on basis of mildly positive moderately or highly positive and these kind of specific uh, things when we do we make trichology into a science instead of just a general thing so what happens is for many years people have been practicing trichology in a very vague non specific way so now that we have specifics on the amount of hair loss and the kind of tests that you can do and the answers you get on trichoscopy uh, trichology is becoming a more scientific and and precise uh, specialty yes. ashwin can we go to the next question please um i will uh, ask any of the panelists who wish to to answer this question what are the clues that help you to differentiate between female pattern hair loss and telogen effluvium dr achita you are there so uh, you have this already and you had said some of the clinical tests plus you mentioned trichoscopy so if you see a patient sitting in front of you and the lady has bent her head to say i think i'm having hair loss or hair thinning then which are the points two or three easy points for your listeners to make out a difference between female pattern hair loss and telogen effluvium who's going to take uh dr achita you start one or two I points can, and the other i can yeah, yeah. dr Pr prashant you want to answer go ahead yeah yeah so in female pattern hair loss you see wide midline partition so that's the first thing which points to female pattern hair loss increased parting width uh, yeah second would be increased partition yeah second yes. would be variation in hair diameter so you get yes. uh, uh, villous hair terminal hair <clears throat> so there is variation uh, whereas in telogen effluvium there won't be uh, uh, there, there'll be diffuse hair loss your pull mm. test will be positive and uh, there won't be uh, variation in hair uh, then hair diameter so these are the pointers uh, easy point two three pointers uh, to differentiate between female hair pattern hair loss and telogen effluvium okay uh, so those are something uh, what about uh, when the would you add the symptom that the patient with uh, telogen effluvium usually comes with a complaint of hair loss whereas the patient with female pattern hair loss uh, uh, alopecia tends to come with a history of thinning no, so not you're saying more anil not necessary even we're just giving broad uh, things for the listeners to understand i understand that there's lot of overlap and you can have telogen effluvium in addition to female pattern hair loss i'm just saying generally if the major complaint mm -hmm. is my hair is thinning out it's usually more in favor of female pattern hair loss right. if my hair is falling out it is more in favor of the telogen effluvium just for a general point there is a lot of overlap in these things and like you said trichoscopy will help and uh, the uh, ratios that you mentioned the less than or equal to 4 is to 1 and more than 8 is to 1 is is something that can help you the anisotrichosis in female pattern hair loss which is miniaturization of the hair will possibly help dr prachita you want to add anything please go ahead yes, i want to add in case of female pattern hair loss which is in early stage that is sinclair one it is yes. very difficult to differentiate between female pattern hair loss versus your telogen effluvium whether you it is could be acute or chronic unless you do trichoscopy because these patients always complain of hair loss only mm. trichoscopy will show in telogen effluvium your uh, less number of hair follicles your uh, coiled hair your knee uh, regrowing hair uh, vis a vis in female pattern hair loss you have the anisotrichosis yes a pull test would be positive in the both 
Sometimes right. you can have the combination of female pattern hair loss as well as acute telogen effluum. So your history also would have, you have to take for the acute telogen effluum. I agree with you absolutely. And some of the things which we're saying is just for a tabular column of differences for clarity. But remember that in practice, we often see an overlap of several conditions. We even have a type of uh, frontal fibrosing alopecia, which for, which almost imitates pattern hair loss. But it's very Nowadays, rare that, NTQ. That yes. way, the frontal fibrosing alopecia in our setting is very extremely rare. It's not yes. very high. There, there are many yes. reasons, then we, I'll tell you a little something. Correct. Can we go to the next question, please, yeah. Ashwin? Um, would either Dr. Prashant, Dr. Rupak, we haven't heard you. How, how important is a trichoscope in your practice? Give us an example of a situation where it has helped you. Do you use one even though you're a transplant surgeon? Yes. It has helped me in diagnosis as well and sometimes explaining patients as well. Because since, since okay. I kind of connect it to, to my laptop and show it to the patients. Yes. Yes. And uh, first... Uh, if you go with the pattern hair loss itself, it is it, it can easily differentiate, or I would not say easily, it will help me in differentiate between the telogen effluvium and uh, androgenetic alopecia as well. Uh, so, and sometimes I show the patients as well. See, this, in this kind of pattern hair loss or androgenetic alopecia, your hairs have thinned out. Okay. So even in explaining the treatment as well, I tell my patients, okay, so with the with the minoxidil that you've been using, probably I can help these thinner hairs to grow thicker, but then it cannot grow hairs in the area where you have complete baldness, which will require a transplant, okay? So sometimes I give them an example of uh, probably a paddy field or something. If the, if the crops are very thin, you can probably add fertilizers and grow. And when the field is empty, you have to Im implant. So many a times patients say, Dr. Sir, this I see, there are, some, there are some hairs I can see. So I, when I show them with the trichoscope, they are more clear on that as well. So I will say in the diagnosis as well as in the counseling, it has helped me a lot. Superb. Okay. Uh, Dr. Prashant, would you like to answer the question, how important is trichoscopy in your practice? Trichoscope. And give an example, practical yeah. example of how it helps you. Yeah. As I said earlier, uh, diffuse alopecia areata is an entity which is really difficult to diagnose unless you use a trichoscope. And it appears uh, to a great extent uh, mm. like, uh, you know, androgenetic Very alopecia. Mm. When, you, uh, when you see through trichoscope, you would be able to see those specific uh, findings of alopecia areata, uh, like exclamation mark here, if it is active, black dots, mm. yellow dots. Uh, yes. As against uh, in androgenetic alopecia, you, where you would see, you know, anisotrichosis and uh, more of uh, uh, villous mm. hair and uh, yes. smaller uh, units, hair follicular units. So I think this is a practical situation where uh, trichoscope would help. Excellent. Any of the other panelists have anything to add? Uh, off label, we are, I started seeing a case of phenotypitis in adults, hmm. uh, which they presented as uh, thinning on the mid skull. When we have seen with the trichoscope, there were uh, signs, trichoscopic signs of phenotypitis, and culture grew uh, trichosporum uh, violation. So in an adult? Yeah, adult, adult, adults. Okay. Yeah, okay. Seven, eight cases. Uh, right. We, we need to be aware of that. So two examples, one given by Dr. Prashant and one by Dr. Rachita, where the trichoscope will totally change your uh, diagnostic, uh, uh, will change your diagnosis and change your approach to treatment because the management of a diffuse alopecia areata will be totally different from androgenetic alopecia and so also for tinea capitis. So great examples. Next question, Ashwin. Next question, Ashwin. Yeah. Uh, what is this fuss about iron and hair loss? Does ferritin really matter in your practice? Now, just to make things a little interesting, I'll go to uh, Dr. Dharamveer. And uh, because usually what happens, not with dermatologists who are transplant surgeons, but those who are pure transplant surgeons, you tend to uh, disregard the medicine of trichology a little bit. What about previous question, please? Uh, what uh, Next one. Why is this? Why are the questions moving up and down? Uh, the one about ferritin, please. Can Ashwin? Yeah, hold it there. Don't uh, move. What is this fuss about iron and hair loss? Does ferritin really matter in your practice, Doctor Dharamveer? Could you answer the question, please? Yes, uh, uh, Jeremy. Uh, uh, apart from hair transplantation, I do my regular consultations as well. So I get a lot of patients of hair loss, uh, both males and females. And particularly, most of the Indian population, they are having uh, low iron stores. And they are, but, uh, mostly females are deficient in the iron. 
so it is important for us to find out their iron status and in this basically serum ferritin is a more uh, i would say sensitive indicator to find out the iron deficiency in a patient and generally the labs uh, they show the the normal ranges are between 20 nanograms per deciliter to uh, moving up to 200 but uh, by going by the few articles are there which suggest mm. that uh, the ferritin level should be around 60 nanogram per deci- uh, deciliter if it is less than 60 nanograms per deciliter then the patient is having iron deficiency in that scenario and we have to work towards improving the iron deficiency okay dr rupak uh, what about you all do you do you, the, is ferritin something that you do for patients with uh, significant hair loss is it one of yes, your usually, systemic tests usually for females yes usually yes. for females yes. okay i i am very particular I, about ferritin so i will just pitch in here because when we mention anemia we need I, to understand that in hair loss there is also a situation where there is non anemic iron deficiency that is the patient's hemoglobin may be normal but at the same time the ferritin reflects the iron stores and uh, ferritin is in a uh, no, way to non toxically transport and store iron so ferritin is important there are two schools of thought among the trichologists there uh, some people give a lot of importance to ferritin other people say that it does not at all but now the uh, interesting hypothesis right now is that there is a threshold hypothesis that is whether you're treating pattern hair loss or whether you're treating alopecia areata or you're treating telogen effluvium if you don't correct the ferritin if the ferritin is low and they say to aim for something mm-hmm. like 70 even though 20 might be the cut off aim for something like 70 and you correct the ferritin with, with uh, you know either with a diet or with iron supplements and you find that whatever else you're treating whether it's a hair transplant you're doing whether you're treating telogen effluvium or you're treating alopecia areata you'll find the response is much better if your ferritin is corrected but remember whenever you're doing ferritin we must also do esr because it is an acute phase reaction uh, dr yeah, zina thank you thank you yeah, yeah doctor I was just about to say what you were saying yes. that uh, um, people say that um, having uh, you know when a person has a good hemoglobin status but a, that mm. same patient may have a very low ferritin level so it's like it's uh, hemoglobin is like having money in your wallet and ferritin is like having money on in your bank so you Super need example. you need so, both yes, yes yeah yeah i was just about about to say that when you Super. said it. so is ferritin yeah. something that you send for your patients especially the uh, yeah, female do. patients with diffuse hair loss yeah i okay. do okay i do and correcting the ferritin really helps because our treatment takes uh, leaps and bounds in improvement when we are right. able to correct these kind of things and it's also very mm. satisfying for a patient to show them a lab report which says you know there is something which yeah. needs to be corrected otherwise we're just talking very peripherally a lot of theory and saying we want to improve your hair loss and giving them a combination of multi multiple nutraceuticals and there yeah. is no basis for what we're doing here uh, this is a wonderful paper that we should read about the threshold hypothesis and understand that whatever else we are doing with hair loss if you're not correcting iron stores your uh, treatment is likely to take a longer time or fail in the management uh, can yeah, we go to the next right. question please Ashwin, can we go to the next question? Please, how is female pattern hair loss different from androgenic alopecia in men? Dr. Rachita, you were uh, uh, dealing with this earlier, and Dr. Prashant also. So, if both of you will tackle this question, how is your female pattern hair yes. loss different yes. from androgenic alopecia yes. in men? What terms? Clinical presentation or no, no, uh, yeah, yeah, management or clinical presentation. How do you see your patients being different? Is it exactly the same? Is it just two different names we have, or? the way they present so the presentation is a uh, different like yes. in males you get a loss of frontal hairline while in females you do not get loss of frontal hairline yes uh, you get a uh, loss from mid skull and nowadays i am seeing a uh, uh, loss from occipital area in females also the treatment part if you look at we uh, however we give anti androgens to males but when it comes to give anti androgen to a female we are little skeptical whether should give finasteride in chat bearing age group or not aldactone has not shown that much efficacy flutamide has some side effects so generally we have limited options to treat a, a female pattern hair, a patient with a female pattern hair loss limited option so topic Dr. Prasant, you wanted to say something and also from the audience question they want to know from you uh, about the you mentioned about spironolactone being combined with minoxidil but when will you use a, okay. a spironolactone for a patient with uh, female pattern hair loss 
and uh, how much will you use can you help us to understand the details of that if possible uh, but answer this okay. question also so how is female, female fat and yeah. hair loss different female. from androgenic alopecia usually uh, uh, men's tend to show more severe grades of androgen dependent hair loss than females uh, and it's usually midline partition uh, that is uh, getting wider over a period of time Yes. Uh, usually, frontal fl- frontal hairline is spared in female pattern hair loss because of aromatase activity. Aromatase, so this yes. is a clinical difference. Yeah. As far as so the patterns are different, different and uh, why it's different uh, also, Doctor Prashant, is probably because females have less androgenic uh, receptors. They have less androgen uh, receptors, androgen, yeah. and the aromatase has a protective action, yeah. so that the pattern is different, which is why uh, the yeah, uh, converts, clinical yeah. yes. So, how will you manage differently? And could there is an audience question on spironolactone? If you want to go into a little bit of detail on that, yeah. See, um, in grade one uh, of female pattern hair loss, I would manage it with uh, nutritional supplements and uh, topical minoxidil, unless there is something specific indicative of some androgen imbalance in the lady, like say uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome or irregular menses. If she has hirsutism, so these are the cases wherein I would like to investigate. For uh, you know, a PCOS panel can be done. We'll look out for uh, something which is abnormal. And if there is uh, hyperandrogenism uh, as per lab report, then I would like to start with anti-androgens. Uh, spironolactone being a, a better choice. There are some cases wherein you get uh, the lab panel completely normal. Uh, here we call end organ sensitivity, and in such cases. If there are severe grades of pattern hair loss, then we need to start with anti-androgen therapy. So you can start off spironolactone, say 50 milligram per day, increase it to uh, 100 milligram, and uh, then to uh, higher doses depending on uh, clinical response. Okay, great. So just one word of caution over there is that often with female pattern hair loss, we don't get uh, changes in the hormones. If you're t- uh, sending for testosterone or uh, free testosterone testing, remember to do it between the fourth to sixth day of cycle and at least two cycles after having stopped uh, oral contraceptives. Otherwise, the results are not uh, easy to interpret. And unless there is a established change in hormonal values, there is no point in, in introducing um, anti-androgens in the, ma- in the management of female pattern hair loss. If you're doing it, then probably a safer drug like finasteride in uh, Asian women, uh, even up to 5 milligrams per day of pinasteride has been suggested in those who have completed their family. So um, we will uh, do any of the one, uh, any of the panelists who are doing predominantly transplant, uh, let me say Dr. Rupak or Dr. Dharamveer, like to comment on how they continue the use of finasteride after their transplant, please. Yes, yes, I do continue with finasteride after the transplant. Also. Yeah, because otherwise your results will tend to slowly uh, taper away, right? Over a period of time, the natural hair, the hair that you uh, other, they had already other than the transplanted yeah. hair will tend to thin out. So yes, that happens actually and we need to counsel the patients regarding taking finasteride and continue it for a pity uh, as much as possible. Yes, I'm mentioning this particularly because sometimes patients come to us and they see transplant as an alternative to taking medical treatment, which is not right. Which transplant is, is to give you good and visible results fast. And then over a period of time, the medical management of your hair loss problem, which is a continuous problem, will need to continue. They can't suddenly stop and say, I've done a transplant. Now I can stop all applications. I can stop all internal medicine. So that's not true. And uh, that uh, kind of, you know, I finished a transplant, I've gone to a hair transplant specialist and I don't need to take any more medical treatment is absolutely incorrect. And those are the patients who come back very unhappy with their results six months or one year down the line. Right? Okay, doctor, next slide. Doctor, next doctor yeah, please. Yes, please. I, I please, please. Yeah, please, please. Please, please. Like, like when we were discussing about um, female pattern hair loss, um, yes. since we don't know, um, we are not very sure about the... Uh, androgen receptors the level of androgens and all that yes yes do we do we uh, do we look into uh, the growth hormones the prolactins and the insulin resistance into do we do we do these tests to find out whether they are responsible for the female pattern hair loss number one and dr rupak i just wanted to ask you whether um, uh, are you doing uh, female hair hair transplants and what yes. is your success uh, I will say uh, if, 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 the, if the female does not have some ongoing illness, like she has got 
uh, PCOS or some hormonal abnormalities, then probably I would ask for the control of the disease first. But if I do not find that hair transplantation has been successful, yeah. I would say. Okay. If I may take uh, part of your question, Dr. Zenat, one of the things is that the donor site needs to be dense. And a lot of times that we find that in female pattern alopecia, the density of the donor site tends to be much lower. It's not as good as in men. Uh, okay. So sometimes the uh, problem with uh, doing a hair transplant in women is that uh, you are going to have a shock kind of reaction on the follicle surrounding the area of transplant and yes. you tend to lose more hair. And the donor site is not very rich in hair so that you don't have that much of hair to spare. So both those factors may play a role. Uh, the first the question that you asked about, yes, in case you're seeing a pattern hair loss and you're seeing other signs of virilization or hormonal imbalance, like we look for in hormonal acne, that is an oily skin, seborrhea, yeah. increased mm -hmm. acne, irregular cycles, uh, you know, a pre uh, menstrual flare of acne. We look for all those factors when we're looking. Then it's important that we do a complete workup and probably we could associate ourselves with one of our colleagues who are an endocrinologist so that we're doing it in a logical manner. A lot of us just send for a free testosterone or prolactin or FSH LH ratio. All of these are falling into disrepute. But if we're doing hormonal testing, it should be done between the fourth and sixth day for you to get the best results. I'm saying if you see any signs of virilizing, then definitely work with an endocrine colleague to get the best uh, interpretable results in while you're doing the hormonal test. What you said is true. We need to do that. But you, entire clinical picture, if it is only thinning of hair and nothing else, then probably if you do it in 100 patients, you're going to get some significant result only in one or two. In case of yes. diffuse pattern hair loss, the uh, response is good. If it is dupa, the diffuse unpatterned hair loss, then probably the result would not be that good. If I if I yes. had to uh, previously yes. assess on that, yes. Yeah. Be because we do see patients who don't have any underlying, uh, with yeah. the investigations that we do, we don't yes. see any underlying issues. And these patients, they do come with visible um, uh, hair thinning. So, uh, are these uh, patients? I'm choosing, I'm choosing the example of acne once again, Dr. Zina, to help yeah. us to be on the same platform. Is that often when we're talking about hormonal acne, it's not like the hormonal levels are way off the range. So it's a very subtle change. It reflects a subtle change. It reflects a subtle change in the, as uh, Dr. Prashant said, the end organ sensitivity. So it's yeah. not like the testosterone level is going to be way out of range or you're going to get prolactin levels which are hugely different. But if the only change, if there are no obvious virilizing signs, you don't need to worry about that. At the most, you could add a finasteride if they've completed their family. And in normal androgenic Asian women, they found that adding 5 milligrams of finasteride gives much better results than minoxidil alone, application of minoxidil alone. So if the person has, is married and has completed her family and has gone through something like a tubectomy, you could think of adding higher doses of finasteride which will give you good results rather than using something like spironolactone or, uh, you know, the other drugs which have m much more side effects that we think about. Right. Uh, can because at, at the moment, what, what we are doing with these patients is giving them uh, spironolactone, but we can't okay. give it forever. And this particular group is our problem because anybody who has uh, completed the family, okay, they are not that much bothered. Yes. Yes. So yes. Uh, regarding the females, I feel that we we are in trouble. Lacking, we are not, yeah. yeah, we are lacking. Uh, all the noise is about the male and they're getting good results. Right. But how do we help our female patients? I that's, feel we overreact to finasteride both in men and women. And uh, if you have the confidence of the patient, you have an educated patient in front of you and they say, I'm unmarried, I don't plan to start a family anytime now, or I'm married and we, my husband and I are on the same page, we don't plan to start a family. It's okay to give finasteride once you've taken a written informed consent, made them understand that you're doing this for a period of time. Uh, if you're pushed to the wall, I think you should think about uh, hormonal intervention. The one that we're most comfortable one with and the one with the least side effects, I think, is finasteride. Ashwin, can we go to the next question, please? Yeah, okay. The, this is directed at Dr. Rachita, and all the panelists can uh, please uh, contribute. How is your use of PRP and low-level laser? Um, how, how is, let's come with the simple bedside procedures we can do. So PRP and low-level laser, even microneedling. Dr. Rachita. Uh, I always combine PRP. I yes. inject PRP and followed by microneedling. Uh, 
I use only microdrain in a patient who do have fear of injections. And you've uh, presented a paper with just microneedling and shown good yes. results, right? Yes. It has shown good results. So, but now I have uh, my protocol has changed. I combined with PRP, which is injectable PRP, not with the microneedling because I don't okay. believe with the microneedling you can uh, deliver all the deliver. Blood to okay. the level. Low level laser therapy. I advise in the patients, especially in female patients who have advanced grades of uh, female pattern hair loss, as a maintenance therapy after PRP or microneedling sessions are over. Okay. Because and this is a home system. therapy also. They can do as a home therapy. Home therapy. This is home, home. therapy. Low home. level is always I ask them to buy a dome, and they can use it because. Since the disease is progressive, people tend to lose the effects of PRP or microneedling over time. So to maintain it, it is a good option. And those who are outstation, they can't come to the clinic for PRP or microneedling sessions. They do not have budget for them. Then at least invest in a low-level laser therapy. Okay. Because that uh, Dr. Lasts Dr. Achita, since you have the most uh, experience with this, could you just tell us? One or two hints uh, with PRP to make the results more effective. Just one uh, or two practical yes. tips. Uh, PRP, you need to concentrate, and uh, I don't believe in giving two ml and four ml because if you look at the scalp area, at least you require six to seven ml of PRP. Now, when you require that much ml of PRP, your whole blood uh, withdrawal is much larger more, amount. Larger yeah. amount. People are taking only 10 ml and preparing yes. PRP. That is useless. So larger and, withdrawal of blood, larger injections, larger, larger amounts. And then I always give with the uh, ring block or uh, regional anesthesia to ease out the cough, you know, or pain. And okay. uh, anything in the method amount. in the centrifuging, anything which uh, which uh, gives I, you a, I, a higher. I I use uh, a refrigerated uh, machine. I, I have okay. whole centrifuge machine. So I use that and which I have already standardized twice. And there are papers. Those of you who want to check, please, there are papers which you can read the details in which she gets the much better yield. So Dr. Rachita has one of the higher yields. Uh, any of the transplant surgeons, uh, Dr. Dharambir, Dr. Rupak, any of you all uh, using PRP together with hair transplant? Yes, yes sir. We, we do. Yeah, please. Dr. Rupak, please go ahead. Most of the time, since my patients come from abroad, so just during before transplant or before implantation, I do PRP. But uh, after three months, six months, I do not find it compulsory. Okay. Results... Are you are you using any of you using PRP to uh, you know increase the sensitivity or the take of the graft? Are you uh, soaking the graft uh, roots in the PRP solution? No, I'm not using sir. It is. I tried, but the drafts were very sticky. I tried once, but I didn't. Okay, because in the literature, you find all these other things being suggested also. Yeah, uh, one I, point is there. I use it, but I don't use a concentrated PRP there. I use after first uh, spin, I use that PRP. That is not actually, that is the plasma. I use yes. that because it becomes sticky. So some growth factors yeah, will be there. Some growth factors will be there. And right. also glucose will be there, no? In plasma. Yes. Uh, yeah. Can the uh, can either Dr. Dar can Dr. Darmi can you take this question? How is your transplant become different in the COVID uh, setting? Did you take a little time to restart? Are you doing anything differently now? Yes, sir. We are taking uh, the uh, major difference which has come is the number of patients has dropped down actually. So mm -hmm. not many patients are coming in this method. They are scared to come. And uh, but as far I as I thought it'd be uh, the other way around, I had a lot of inquiries and the people wanting, yeah, inquiries, to... inquiries are there, sir. But yeah. uh, that is some uh, surgeons, uh, the number of patients has increased because they are finding it uh, the time to be very convenient for them because they and don't the have visible to VIP out. patients, those in TV and film, they don't have a they have a nice gap over there where nobody's going to yeah, see them, exactly. For them, yeah. it's a very good time to get it done. So, but they are also finding it a uh, uh, little dangerous to get it done uh, mm. right now. But as far as uh, hair transplant is concerned, so just by taking all the proper uh, precautions and uh, doing the sanitization work, so we can carry out a procedure. And, uh, I don't think so. there is any problem with uh, doing that. Dr. Dharmi, are you hot and uncomfortable for long periods of time in that? 
uh, I can visualize uh, standing in that must be very tiring. And no, 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 not that. Actually, we are uh, using air conditioned environment, okay. and and we are basically all the staff and everybody we are uh, regularly checking and uh, taking proper history almost every two three days. So that Super. we are doing it to find out that any of the staff is not having any kind of plus. Also, we are uh, asking our patients to remain isolated for at least a period of seven days before they come for the procedure. Doctor Zina, Doctor Zina, is PRP yes. something that you do? Is it yes. something that you and uh, you would like to have any input on that? Is uh, is it giving good results? Yeah, it is giving it is giving good results. But it it uh, for me it's not in not a standalone. So yes. uh, yeah, patients come like um, I start them. I put them on uh, minoxidil with derma roller, and mm. they do it. They do it at home. Plus, um, maybe I give finasteride for three to six months, not for a longer duration, because the male patients are so bothered about that. And if I don't tell them, the pharmacy guy tells them. So. Um, with um, with derma roller and minoxidil monthly prp for uh, four to six months and then maybe top ups in every six months so your patients are a little nervous about injections is that uh, one of the reasons some, that you no it's not that actually some patients are very very uh, very very frightened of it or some patients mm. are very, they're very brave but when they start feeling the pain then they jump so yeah. that, that is there. You get different types of patients. I put give a little. I tell them to take a little bit of sedative before that, and uh, give them a break. So yes. You okay. Thank. Thank you so much. We are answering a lot of the audience questions also without realizing it. Like the last question that came in was uh, whether PRP you prefer injectable or with the derma roller. I think Dr. Rachita and Dr. Zinath have dealt with that. That probably the more effective one might be the injection, but sometimes you have to adjust your method according to the patient. Next question, please, Ashwin. Can we? Yeah. What is the psychological impact of hair loss, Dr. Zina? Would you take that since you're there already? Is there like people are really conscious about hair loss and worried and scared and panicky, or you feel that the hair the hair loss itself is causing stress or stress is causing hair loss? What What do you think, Dr. Zina? Uh, you know, um, hair loss is uh, like a Losing hair, having good hair is like equating it to your youthfulness. Uh -huh. So people, people uh, always equate it with their good health, with their youthfulness. So once they start losing it, they are psychologically they are some are uh, some people are very devastated. Not all maybe, but they do seek help. And uh, uh, what I would like to say is that uh, there are, there are certain cases where stress. Uh, Stress may induce uh, hair fall, like um, if uh, if if it's a child, if you're uh, dealing with a child or with an adolescent with family history of stress, the patient comes with trichotillomania. So that mm -hmm. is one one sort of stress that they have, and they are losing hair. And uh, peop and uh, pregnant ladies, they go through the stress of pregnancy, they lose hair. So these are the normal cases of stress where it it causes hair loss. But uh, psychosocial impact of hair loss is a big, is a, huge. is a big thing. It's a huge, it's huge thing, huge thing now. So it starts, the, with, uh, it, starts, it starts with hair loss causing stress and then stress causing more hair loss. Possibly. Yeah, some, sometimes, right? yeah, sometimes it does like that, yeah. Okay, Dr. Prashant, could I uh, tack, uh, ask you to tackle yeah. this question and tell me, uh, what are the kinds, when you say stress causes hair loss, what are the kind of patients complain that you hear? Because of job loss, because of COVID, yeah, because are, of yeah. what, what are the kind in, of situations you see? In, in, in this particular uh, scenario, there is a lot of migration which has happened. Like uh, a few days back, a patient of mine came from a city where he used to study. He has come back. Uh, he's waiting for his IIT, JE exams. Uh, they are not happening. It's uh, He has to study and he's losing a lot of hair because he had just migrated from where he was staying for two years and now he's in his hometown and he's mm -hmm. losing a lot of hair so everyone in the family is very stressed out because he's not being able to concentrate on his studies so mm -hmm. it's not only you know migration unemployment studies uh, exams getting postponed uh, 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 loss of a person uh, in your fam from your family all these are uh, severe stress uh, related situations and these are causing a lot of psychological impact 
uh, on hair growth and you know it leads to hair loss okay all right so those we are we are fairly certain that our patients are having significant stress uh, because of their hair loss and whether the stress is making hair loss worse is also a, a moot point in connection to this because there are lots of questions about finasteride lots of questions about minoxidil so i will deal with uh, the question about finasteride first people want to know how safe it is what are the problems that you face do your patients come back and uh, you know tackle you because you've given them finasteride and they want to know about the nocebo effect does any one of you want to tackle it or otherwise i i i enjoy talking about finasteride so after you have finished i would like to give an input so any patients of you all are, okay okay patients are very scared of finasteride and sometimes uh, the, they only when the concern is of the sexual impotence i I asked them to watch this recent movie by uh, Rajkumar, which was made in China. So what yes. I tell them, please go and watch that movie. So many patients, those who have had that, that sexual side effects, is probably due to that psychological thing. Okay. Yes. So many. Yes. This, this is I asked them to watch that movie, and sometimes I saw I open Google and saw them that even the Donald Trump is taking finasteride. So 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 I tell them the 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 most powerful person in this world is 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 taking. Finish right, and he, his wife is twenty years younger and still happy. And <laughs> so, so, but objectively, if you ask me, objectively, I, it has been very rare instances that patients actually have had uh, sexual impotence or the uh, loss of libido. Okay, whether Donald Trump's uh, wife is really happy or not, we will have to ask her. But <laughs> she looks happy, and when she's the president's wife, I suppose she'll be happy. No, uh, that's what I tell you. I counseling the patients. <laughs> good, good point. But I think that you know, as uh, as dermatologists and qualified doctors who use medicine, I think it is not right on right on our part to be nervous or scared of any drug which is effective. and the only two drugs which are uh, approved by the fda for use in pattern hair loss whether it's androgenic alopecia or female pattern hair loss is finasteride in androgenic alopecia and minoxidil so if there is a drug which is approved and we're using so many drug combinations which we are not sure about we're using it in the hope that it will give our patient benefit like biotin and things like that i think finasteride in all recent studies including the statement from the uh, international society of hair hair restoration surgeons has said that there is you know it's predominantly a nocebo effect because of fear that we create it's a good drug if used correctly and you know if you included your patient as long as they're not planning a family immediately or they're not going for infertility treatment in those kind of patients your mind itself should tell you that you don't want to use that otherwise it's a good drug used correctly and used in combination with minoxidil it gives you the best results there are enough papers to tell you that it's effective and that in combination with minoxidil it is probably the combination for pattern hair loss so i don't see any reason for us not to use finasteride some of the things that you know like post finasteride syndrome which was mentioned by dr prashant a lot of it is hype in nocebo phenomenon the, they there's been a recent paper the more you suggest side effects and that was in prostate hypertrophy the people who had these uh, sexual side effects were the ones in whom the doctor mentioned over and over again that it put it potentially could cause these side effects and those were the only group of patients who had significant side effects does it ever cause a problem do patients come back yes but i think as senior and experienced doctors by now we should be able to know how to use a drug and explain a drug to a patient so that they have confidence in the drug that you're using we are using methotrexate we are using biologicals we are using azathioprine we are using so many drugs without any fear then why should we have fear for a drug which is effective i have on my computer a list of side effects which includes liver trans uh, liver uh, failure renal impact you know serious side effects drug rash and uh, possibly even death and i ask a patient will you take a drug like this which has all these side effects and they will say no and i'll say this these are the listed side effects of paracetamol which is the crocin you take every day for fever so if i'm giving you a drug it's because i trust and believe that this drug is going to help you if you have trust and faith in your doctor then this is the therapy that is ideal for you over and above that we should not be forcing anybody to take a drug if they have fear so finasteride is a good drug finasteride by itself together with minoxidil is good and even pre and post transplant we should be using it i think that fear element of finasteride we should remove from our minds um dr zinath uh, there is a question about minoxidil side effects in women and uh, how do you use it so that you minimize the side effects for your female patients uh, do you use 2% or 5% they've asked lots of questions about minoxidil 
So, Dr. Zina, could you uh, take, tackle the question of minoxidil application? Yeah, uh, thank you. Like uh, for minoxidil, um, personally, I, uh, I tell my patients to take once daily of 2 ml of 5% minoxidil because um, as it is, 2% takes a long time. And, yeah. but, but, but there are papers saying that 2% and 5% women, they both act similarly. So um, I tell them to use it. Um, one of my methods is that when they use it, they should apply the medicine, the, put the spray on the top of the scalp and then drag it downward and not come up to the front ha uh, hairline. Mm. That, way, that way you don't, put, you don't get the medicine on your forehead because uh, what happens is that if the medicine comes to the forehead before you see hair growth on the scalp where you yes. want it really, it comes more on the scalp. Or, yes. or over, over the other areas. So uh, washing hands after that and trying to put it on the reverse way, not this way, but this way. That is my one take. And the second take is that when I tell uh, my patients to use minoxidil and when they take shower the next day, I tell them to uh, take shower in such a way so that the, the initial water goes uh, backwards. Um, away, uh, uh, yeah, backwards, away, away from the face. Away Upa. from the face. So Good that, news. Uh, yeah, that is, those are the hints which I try to give them. And uh, for ladies also, I tell them that since they have more hair, they should uh, use the, my, uh, the uh, derma roller at least once a day if it's too painful for them every alternate day in unidirection because they, they, they don't want to shorten their hair. So they will use it unidirectionally. That's, I add derma roller to, the, uh, to that regime of minoxidil. Thank you so much. Dr. Rachita, do you have anything to add to help the, uh, prevent the side effects in a female patient when you're using minoxidil? Uh, I would raise uh, uh, just the side effects profile. If it is a mild, then I'll tell them to continue. And after uh, the scaling is there, then I can add anti-dandruff shampoo. Uh, sometimes I add topical steroids. If the severity is very high, then I would withdraw the topicals, uh, minoxidil, and give oral. Okay. So that is depending upon the, uh, you know, uh, the severity of side effects. There was a, there was a, the patient is still not uh, convinced about oral minoxidil, then I would suggest that at least apply minox topical minoxidil for uh, two to three hours and shampoo it out. Before With the that, five. Yeah. With that, uh, the scaling and aging is much less. Okay. Dr. Rupak, do you use okay. minoxidil uh, after hair transplant and when do you restart if you use? What is the gap before and after transplant? After, yeah, before transplant, I would say at least stop it one week before. Mm -hmm. And I usually remove the, the crust removal. I, I usually do it on seven to nine days. So immediately okay. after crust removal, I start minoxidil and I do not have had any problems. And about using minoxidil in female, there was a video in American Ac Academy of Dermatology. So they make a partition in the mid first, like Dr. Gina said, apply it from the back. Then you make a right partition, one, two, three, and left partition and make around 10 points. So so that's what, that's what, if we counsel it that way to the patients, they are many a times, they use it like a hair oil sometimes. So yes. why, what I ask is, ask them to make a partition and use it over the scalp. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Super, Dr. Very... Rupa. So, to uh, some of the uh, some of the precautions that I take, yes, I use five percent. I don't think two percent gives very good results. So, mm -hmm. if if they're having a facial hirsutism, you avoid the night application as much as possible. And even if they're doing the night application, you have a cloth over the pillow because from the hair it goes onto the pillow cover, and the chances of you um, you know getting it onto the face is more. Uh, what Dr. Zinat said about you know application carefully. And uh, Dr. Rupak has underlined the fact that you create a path or you draw a grid, you draw the scalp and say two in each quadrant and don't bring it too much in front. The other thing that I think is much better to take it on your palm and apply with your fingertip than spray or use the uh, dropper because especially with the dropper, you find a lot of it coming onto the neck and in this area is where it stimulates the hair growth. So some of the things that we can do is, you know, help your patient through careful instructions so you don't get side effects. Dr. Dharamir, uh, do you get, uh, do you prefer the foam preparation post transplant? Is there any difference in the preparation that you use? Oh, so I prefer a lotion only, and uh, generally I start uh, minoxidil at least after a month's time. Okay. I want uh, the you give a longer gap. 
yeah longer gap the reason being is because i gave it uh, like after i started one week uh, post hair transplant i started giving uh, minoxidil that led to that led to increased in irritation and scaling and dandruff formation so that was the reason then i postponed it to after one month time and till that time the the telogen phase is also over in uh, transplant patient so Great. that that gives a better results for me as far as my patients are concerned okay then we are having some uh, questions about uh, any of you are using oral minoxidil and you have um, experience to share what is I, the I, I do i do have used oral minoxidil at a dosage of 2.5 mg okay and in couple of patient i used uh, for a period of 3 uh, months but i didn't find it has to be that effective and maybe i should have used a little more or uh, i should have combined it with uh, other modes of therapy Mm-hmm. Only two patient and very less patient to say to comment about it about the results of uh, oral minoxidil. I okay. think we should be uh, studying it on more number of patient. We should be giving it to. Uh, Doctor Rachita, I have some questions addressed directly to you. Does yes. are you worried about PRP in the COVID era? Have you changed in any way? And um, um, that is from Doctor Usha. Uh, khemani khemani and then micro needle uh, micro needling and injectable um, prp can you compare is there any comparison that you've done we had published a study of micro needling and injectable prp uh, uh, uh the concentration and in the different way you can read that paper in covid era, era i was little skeptical to do prp in in patients uh, we don't know the uh, patients covid status but now after taking due precaution i am doing prp in uh, my patients okay and dr achita a uh, question again to you what about uh, your preference for dutasteride is well known and you have a publication also on that so uh, what do you find is an advantage of dutasteride over finasteride and do you uh, prefer that to finasteride i always prefer dutasteride over finasteride uh, reasons uh, what what are, what are the reasons better this is in a, in a, study done by so far they are not mentioned the improvement in thin hair count while mm. we had done the study in nasteride group we are not seen in change in thin hair count mm. there was a change in thick hair count are great what we have seen in dutasteride group but change in thin hair count that means the reversal of miniaturization was much better in dutasteride group and therefore i believe dutasteride is much superior than finasteride it has been approved by korea and japan and there it is a first line therapy okay do you have a, a adjustment of dose or do you give it every day 0.5 mg the same way that the um, we give daily finasteride 1 mg do you uh, give yeah uh. I, i give thrice a week initially for a few months Be- because if, it has a longer duration yeah, of a longer duration if i feel that patient is not uh, showing some result in the form of pull test is not becoming a uh, negative uh, still patient is shedding hair then only i make it daily and i have seen that making daily has shown better improve uh, results than uh, on alternate days basis okay uh, so we've uh, tackled almost all the questions that have been asked by the uh, delegates and it's been wonderful uh, chatting with all of you we've had two great uh, speakers to start off the session thank you so much for our neighbors to join us it was wonderful to have both of you dr zina dr rupak really nice to have you with us and uh, thank you to the uh, stalwart speakers dr dharamveer and dr prashant palvade thank you dr rachita you are the uh, icon of knowledge thank as far as psychology is concerned thank you so much it was wonderful and thank you especially to the brinton team and to mr shri kumar for bringing us together for international alopecia day i think we've had a very fruitful discussion i hand it back to mr shri kumar for any closing comments yeah thank you thank you all i will hand it over to my colleague mr shujatullah khan who heads this division from a marketing point of view to have the closing remarks please shujat over to you thank you shri and a uh, very warm welcome and to all the doctors who are here and uh, thank you each and every one for being part of this uh, very important international webinar mm. Uh, which was on international alopecia day i would also uh, like to mention this is this was today yesterday was not just international alopecia day we had a list of festivities around especially eid ul adha followed with uh, today it's a friendship day 
and as well as tomorrow we have raksha bandhan so in this festive season i am very happy to see in spite of all your commitments most of the uh, panelists as well as the speaker the moderator and the audience were able to make it thank you so much each and every one special thanks goes to dr anil abraham for making this moderation as sweet as humble as he is and as strong as his multi talented skills thank you so much uh, dr anil we definitely enjoy watching you offline of your scientific uh, uh, laughter uh, programs also we love to watch you more and more sir please continue and uh, we love to see you more and uh, very happy to see a very young uh, speaker we two speakers we had dr dharamveer singh and dr prashant they were very very apt and the complete detailed presentation in just 10 to 12 minutes i think sir hats off to both the speakers for ensuring to complete and cover the entire important elements related to your topic another onset i would like to wholeheartedly thank the entire cross border as well as uh, the indian uh, speaker ma'am dr rachita durat thank you so much ma'am for giving and volunteering from the side of the country and the nation and giving your perspective all three were a bit on sharing their experiences thanks to dr rupak dr rupak thank you so much for last minute uh, taking our uh, request and joining us uh, and it was very interesting to hear you for the very first time sir we love to hear you more and more now and we look forward from brinton to strongly associate with you and dr zinat thank you ma'am thank you so much in spite of your eid ul adha you made sure uh, you be uh, here um, i'm sorry if we have really taken your few hours of even evening no, no. it was lovely to have you ma'am my pleasure thank Hi, you Zinat. thank you wonderful uh, seeing you. wonderful seeing our colleagues from across the borders and so nice and we hope to continue interacting with you all in this healthy manner on dermatology trichology and other related topics thank you so much for joining us thank, thank you sir you. thank you so much thank you so thank much. you everyone thank, thank you, you everyone. thank you britain thank, thank you shri dr ashwin you have been awesome on uh, entire uh, moderation thank you so much all our uh, colleagues and we wish ganesh daima for his uh, excellent uh, uh, portfolio on hair care for team britain thank you each and every one thanks to our national sales manager mr nemi nathan as well and his entire team for ensuring to get the audience together in this uh, evening that's today thank you everyone take thank care you so have a great thank evening you. Thank, you. thank you thank you so much once again thank you thank you, thank you. brinton pharmaceuticals has always been in forefront in disseminating medical and scientific information in collaboration with eminent medical personalities we hope that this webinar helps you in emerging as a well informed medical professional please do subscribe our printen youtube channel till then stay tuned stay safe and stay healthy thank you